In Exodus 15, after the Red Sea is departed, been parted, and the enemies of Israel destroyed, the Moses has a song. And after Moses' song, Miriam, Aaron's sister, picks up her tambourine, the prophetess, and dances a victory song too. That's beautiful. In Christ, the Red Sea has already been parted for us, and our enemies have already been destroyed. I think at the end of all things, when we see Jesus face to face, we would have danced. <laughs> I don't think we would have needed to be prodded. I think we'll look back and said we should have danced in the midst of whatever I was going through. Not dance when my Red Sea has been parted because it's already been parted in Christ, but dance before my Red Sea has been parted. I'll dance in front of the sea. That's what Jesus has given us by grace. We're moving to a time of giving in our worship time. Giving's just pouring out our oil physically, <coughs> our resources. And so as we gather that, Mr. John, we appreciate it. We're going to bless the, our offering. We give because we are already blessed. Thank you, Jesus. My wife said, okay, that makes me sound better, I guess. <laughs> I wanted to give a, a continued praise for Calvin. He's moving on up <laughs> to the east side. He'll be in, in Compass soon. He's getting more freedom. He's getting healthier. He's getting more clarity. God is good for that continued healing. We thank you for that, Jesus. We agree as he comes back stronger than before is what we believe. Father, we bless this giving. We bless this time. We bless as we eat together as a family your word. We thank you for it. We thank you for it. We are going to leave here full of joy and full of glory because that's just what you do, Jesus, as we eat supper, as we dine with you. We enter and fellowship with you now. We've heard the knock and we open ourselves to it. You teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. There we go. I might need this. <laughs> Beautiful time to be with family. As always. If you wanted to start opening towards 2 Corinthians, we're going to be in chapter 5. We'll start around verse 11, but you'll see what we'll get to in a moment. But 2 Corinthians... Chapter 5, verse 11. When you hear the word reconciliation, I mean, this is kind of like a small group here, so we can have some interaction. <laughs> when you hear the word reconciliation, what comes to mind or to reconcile? What comes to mind? Anything? Anything? Or what situation comes to mind? Reconciliation or to reconcile. Repair, the breach. Repair, the breach, forgiveness. I think those all are good. I think we should and we do think in terms of relationships, right? To reconcile. Like we may think of uh, parents and child who are estranged for a time and then they reconcile. Or a husband and wife who goes through it and are separated from a time, and then they come back together. There's forgiveness, there's repair, there's restoration, there's reconciliation. I want to say this about the word reconciliation, because Jesus has given us the, the message of reconciliation, and he has provided for us reconciliation. And if we're not careful, we will think in terms of contract instead of covenant. He said, and it's, and it's a little, little difference 
that makes a big deal in our hearts because a contract has legal parties that agree to terms, right? And it's surrounded by a transaction. And sometimes we deal with our salvation, our relationship with Christ as a contract. And it was never meant to be that. From the beginning, it was a covenant. And a covenant is surrounded by a relationship. Not a business dealing, a relationship. A contract doesn't sustain me and my wife's relationship. And Jesus and, and Yah- well, Yahweh, from the beginning, reveals the way he looks at Israel and us as a bride. And that's covenant. But we sometimes stoop down and treat that beautiful, relational, unconditional covenant as a contract. And I have to give my faith back for something. He'll reward me, or my works, or my life, or my consecration, or my obedience. And if I do this and do my terms of the agreement, right, then God will do his terms of the agreement. And that's a contract, and that's not what you're in, thank God. (laughs) Because he single-handedly, in Christ, does his side, covenant, unconditionally. It's not conditional based on what you do. It's unconditionally based on what Christ did. And you'll see here that reconciliation is a word that Paul uses to intimate these terms of the covenant we're in, the unconditional love committed covenant that actually the father had with the son before the foundation of the world. It was a covenant. And we are included in it by grace. And we, it is applied to us by the Holy Spirit in us. And we're just a party that gets to enjoy now. Not a party that has to do something to earn something. That's a business dealing, and that's transactional. In the West, in America, we have made salvation transactional in many ways. And that takes away all the beauty of a relational, unconditional covenant of love, a marriage covenant, which is what we're in. Guys, we got to be thinking correctly, and Paul's going to help us here today. So we're in 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 11 is where we'll start, but we're going to get uh, pretty soon down. But Paul starts here. He says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it's known also to your conscience. We're not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. So Paul's having some issues with false teachers is what's happening there in the church at Corinth, and so he's addressing that a little bit. And so he says in verse 13, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if, in other words, if we have, it seems we've lost our mind, <laughs> then this is for God. But if we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us or constrains us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, And therefore, all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come, and all this is from God, who in Christ, through Christ, reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. There it is. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Look at verse 13. 
Paul's saying, if it seems I'm out of my mind, and there's, when he talks about being beside himself, connected to that is his encounters with God. He goes on to these, especially in 2 Corinthians 12, where he says, I was caught up to the third heaven, and I heard things that, that men can't even speak of, the encounters that he had with God there. But he says, I'm not saying this to boast, but I'm just letting you know, as far as revelations and things, that, that what you see, as far as this poor little old Paul, <laughs> probably a humble-looking man, he says, God has entrusted some things to me. I know this. And so he says, with these encounters with God, yes, it was, there was a, a level of ecstasy and spiritual experience. And so, yeah, the world does think I'm out of my mind when I share these things. Have you ever had some encounters where people said, man, you, you <laughs> look at you a little different when you're trying to explain them? That's okay. The, the Holy Spirit will give you those too. But Paul's saying, that's for God. And that's in my, a lot of times in my, my closet that happens in my private place, in my prayer closet. But he says, with you guys, second half of the verse, if I'm in my right mind, it's for you. So in other words, when I give you words of teaching and revelation and, and clear things that you can understand, this is also, this is, God has also granted that to you. But he's saying, then he goes on to say, but what's making him out of his mind is the thing. And he starts unpacking this message that is causing him to have his mind blown. That's the way you could say it. What is blowing Paul's mind? <laughs> and we find that it's this message of reconciliation that he's unpacking. And you go on to verse 14. He says, for the love, the agape of Christ controls us, constrains us, because we have concluded this, and this is what's crazy, and if you just gloss over it, you'll miss it. You can't. So camp out in verse 14 at the end of it. That one has died for all, therefore all have died. I want you to hear that <laughs> and read it again. Paul says, the love of God compresses on me, constrains me. He says, I'm no longer led by the law, the outward form of the law, but I'm led by the inward compelling of love. And that's called being led by the Spirit, by the way. Galatians 5 talks about that. So this is not an outside-in reality, but an inside-out reality that Paul's talking about. But he's saying, what happened when Jesus died? Look at the end of verse 14. This is a big question. What exactly happened when that, what in the flesh seemed just like a poor carpenter's son with a Messiah complex, died that day 2,000 years ago? And we have not had a high enough Christological mindset to even begin to wrap our minds around what Paul just says at the end of there. So look at it. That one, Christ, has died for all, all people, the cosmos, the world. Therefore, all have died. When Jesus died, everyone died. Huh? <laughs> really? When Jesus was buried, we were buried. Everyone. All. And when Jesus rose, there you go, there's the good news. We rose with him. And we, we ascended, we ascended. We were co-crucified. We were co-buried in Christ. We were co-risen, and we have co-been ascended with Christ. What do you think it means to be in Christ? And I keep sharing this. I share it to myself, so I start believing it too. Over 140 times in the new covenant, your identity is in him or in Christ. 140 times. Imagine if I put you in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico right now, which I wouldn't advise, I guess, with the recent events the past few days, but we're protected. <laughs> and you get plopped down in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, swimming, surrounded by water, and the whole time you beg and plead, I just want to get wet. 
Lord, help me get wet. And people standing on the boat looking at you swim, asking this, would probably say, well, you've lost your mind, but not in the good way, like Paul did. <laughs> or you're a, maybe a fish in the ocean and your native habitat is in the water and you swim through the water and the water swims uh, through you and, and that's where you live and your thought as that fish is, man, I really, really wish I could get into some water right now. That's delusional, right? Well, welcome to most of our prayer lives. When we're begging, Lord, just be with me. Lord, your presence, just I need your presence right now. Just be with me. We are implying there's a separation where there is none to begin with. And we're contradicting what Jesus said in John 14, 20. In that day, which is this day after the Holy Spirit is given, you will know that I am in the Father. You are in me, and I am in you. You're already that fish surrounded by water. You don't have to ask to get wet. The presence of God is around you and through you and in you already. Your awareness has to catch up to it. And because we have not renewed our mind, we believe there's a separation. Or if you remember two weeks ago, Paul ended the beauty of Romans 8 with this declaration over us. Therefore, there is no separation from the love of God for us. No separation. The only separation or alienation exists in our mind. And when Jesus came down, and this is what's so important, he wrapped himself in our skin. That's what the incarnation is. He became human when he wasn't before. He became one of us truly. And he carried us, because we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world, all the way through that perfect life so that you live that perfect life in him. So that when you pass through the virgin womb and you pass through the virgin tomb with him. Do you want to know when you were born again? 2,000 years ago when Jesus was born and when Jesus died and when Jesus was resurrected. You were born again. That is when Paul says in Romans 6, you were baptized. Now, you became aware of it at a certain time. You came down to an altar, and, and, and you had an experience of faith and all those things, but that was your awakening. That was your discovery of what Christ did 2,000 years ago is what that was. You were in him. You existed in the center of God's heart then and now. You can't get any more in him than you are right now. We just need a new reference point. We're not doing things for a God way off there. We're doing things from him, from the center of him. We don't, we're not under obligation to do things for a deity. That's how the pagans viewed the deity way up there. To send us your weather and send us this and send us that. We are doing ours from the center of a triune dance. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have been absorbed into this covenant of loved, love. And now we can rest there and abide there, Jesus says. He says, you've died. Look at verse 15. The one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their, sight, for their sake died and was raised. What happened when this son was resurrected? This is why Paul says this, I have been crucified with Christ. Because when Christ died, he died. Now, he called Paul from the, from the womb, he says in Galatians 1. But he says, in the fullness of time, when it pleased the Father to reveal his son in me. He says, I got a revelation of that. Is when it happened in time for me. But he died. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ Jesus now lives in me. 
In the life I now live, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Even the faith is of him. You gotta borrow his faith, even. (laughs) It's not separate from him. It's even an act of his grace. And so you don't try to die to self. You can't squeeze out enough self-effort and enough penance and beat yourself over the head enough and whip yourself into shape enough to die to self. You must reckon yourselves dead, Paul says, and alive to Christ. It's a fact. It's an announcement that already happened. You are, you've already died. The only thing that hasn't caught up to that is the awareness in your mind of it. The old you, the person, and now you are to live to Christ. I want you to see it. Paul makes it very clear, and you can just kind of listen or make it, if you do make notes, Put a note in uh, Acts, no, I'm sorry, Romans 6. Romans chapter 6. Paul makes this so clear and it's so beautiful. He says this, do you not know, this is around verse 3, do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were baptized into his death. That's when your real baptism happened. And now you got wet with some water when you became aware of it. But 2,000 years ago is when your baptism happened. His baptism was our baptism. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. It goes on to say in verse 11, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. When he died, we all died. When he rose, we all rose. This is good news, and we need to stop giving the dead man any respect Religion wants you to wrestle with the dead man or comes up with tips and tricks to kind of push him down and kind of, in the gospel and the message of reconciliation is not do a better job wrestling with the old dead man. It's reckon the dead man dead. And that doesn't mean your feelings or thoughts will totally go away, but they're just feelings or thoughts. And when they come back in, you say, no, he's dead. And I'm alive in Christ. And your confession and your belief The repentance, metanoia, which means putting on a new mindset to think differently after encountering the gospel, that is what will bring you to this revelation. Keep doing that. This is not something that just happened at an altar 10 years ago. This is something that happens every day. Repentance is an ever-growing mindset in Christ. So give the dead man no respect. You're free to live for him now. What does he go on to second half of verse 15? That those who might live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake was died, died and raised again. So what religion wants you to do is get you obsessed over your personal spiritual life. Religion wants to make you obsessive about whether you're consecrating correctly or whether you're doing this correctly or whether you're, you're, you're praying hard enough. or whether. And as you get obsessed and get that religious obsession, that's just as bad as the dude that's obsessed over alcohol or sex or money. The religious obsession can be a, a little sneakier because we're doing that for God, right? No. He sets you free from self so that now you can think not about self all the time and how you're doing in reference to God. You're free from that, but that you may now live for him and others. And that's called love. Religion doesn't set you free to love. Religion actually enslaves you and others because you project the enslavement that you have every time. If you're in chains here, religiously speaking, legalistically speaking, then you'll also project those chains onto others, always. But if you are set free here in love, realize that that's a dead man and now I'm free to live and enjoy the covenant, you know what others will start to do just by you being the new you? They will also be free to love 
and enjoy the covenant of Christ. You will invite them there, whether you ever physically do it or not, or verbally. We are dead, but we have been raised in Christ. And so what does Paul say? I love verse 16. Look at verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. I want you to hear that. He didn't say from now on, we regard, okay, you little guys in this church building no longer regard each other according to the flesh. No, he says from now on, we regard no one. No one. Because when Christ died, all died. From now on, we regard no one according to just what we see, according to just what we think, according to the biases we bring, according to just our own opinions and thoughts towards them. From now on, Paul says, we regard no one according to the flesh because that person has died too, just as much as you have. It's one thing to know that Christ in you is the hope of glory, and the church needs to get back to that. But it's another thing to know that Christ in them is the hope of glory too. Right? From now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Some of us need to start with ourselves. From now on, you don't need to regard yourself according to the flesh. Because if you can't start with yourself, you're definitely not going to start with the people out there. From now on, quit regarding yourself or your past according to the flesh. It's dead. It's gone. That which God can't even remember, we don't need to dwell on. From now on, we regard no one. What we see is not reality. It's temporary. And so we put people in categories, right? Fleshly categories. They're political. Well, there's this one's conservative. This one's liberal, right? And this one's LGBT, and this one's this, right? You're, well, you're regarding them according to the flesh. And this one's black, and this one's white, and this one's Latino. Oh, and this one's a legal immigrant, and this one's an illegal immigrant. Okay, according to the flesh. Let's keep it going. Oh, we're stepping on some toes now, aren't we? From now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Their economic status, their sexual status, their religious status. You got the atheists over there, and you got the Muslims over there, and you got the guys. How do you know that this is not the heart of God other than this verse? Because Jesus put a sledgehammer down on the Pharisees who regarded everyone according to the flesh. He used Samaritans, which were the worst of the worst according to the Jews, as the good guys. The good Samaritan. What? That would be like saying the good, the good atheist. That's, that, that was Jesus' parable. Or the good Muslim. Hmm. Or the good Democrat for some. Yeah. <laughs> That's what Jesus did in his, and he hung out with those people. <laughs> And now we, religion, wants you to regard everyone according to the flesh. And it wants you to put everyone in a category. And it wants you to put everyone in an us and a them. Because we could do us versus them. We can keep this thing going on forever and ever. And guys, here's a little secret. This comes from the very beginning, part of the fall. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Or the tree of the law that we apply to all people is another way of looking at it. And we have these people that are in, and we have these people that are out. And first we apply it to ourselves, of course. And because we're so fractured because we eat of this tree, we, uh, we project that fracturing onto others. And the violence that we've already felt and done to ourselves and our nature and, and, and the image of God in us is the violence that we'll project to others. And so the tree of eternal life that Christ gives regards no one according to the flesh, but grace. We don't see through the lens of the law anymore, but the lens of Christ, grace personified. And we're not a people of categories anymore. Lepers here and tax collectors here and prostitutes here and Samaritans here. Jesus destroyed those categories and he destroyed the us and them paradigm. Because Paul said, when one died, Christ, all died. And we regard no one according to the flesh ever since then. And we've been given the message of reconciliation. There's treasure in those people. 
on the other side of the line. That's part of what Jesus, I believe, was talking about in Matthew 13, 48, as a treasure hidden in the hill, because I believe he was the man who sold all. He was the man who stooped down. Jesus was the man who purchased that field, and we, humanity, was that treasure. The message of reconciliation sees a treasure where the world sees a barren field. The message of reconciliation and those who are ambassadors of it sees treasure in every human they meet where the world sees a worthless field. Because that's what Jesus did with us. And we have been entrusted to the same exact message. He is inviting us to look prophetically at each and every person we meet. We've made prophetics about reading signs and reading the times and <laughs> there's an aspect of that. How about this speaking life where there is no life? Your past is dead. In verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And that's not a conditional, that's an unconditional that if is a, a, is a sense, it's conclusive. In Christ, you are a new creation, period. Your past is dead, and all he sees is new. All he sees is new. And this is, incre this is pretty incredible to me, because the word is creation, and it's not creature, because we would think in terms of us, not just being creation, but a creature. But that's because we don't know what Jesus did at the cross. We think it's just about changing me and my personal destiny from hell to heaven. No, it's about changing the whole cosmos is what Jesus did at the cross. And changing the whole cosmos now through you as a son a manifest son of God. This is what he talked about in Romans 8, remember? Romans 8, all creation groans for the revealing of the manifest sons of God. And I see, I think a part of that is it's groaning, this new creation is groaning for the sons to rise up and start giving a message of reconciliation. It's waiting. Not a message of religion, not a message of legalism, not a message of do's and don'ts and this or that or us versus them, but a message of reconciliation that considers no man according to the flesh or woman, no matter how they identify. What happened in Christ happened to the cosmos. I want you to hear that. Jesus was the first fruit, it says in Scripture, that means he's the first one of what's to come. That means he's the firstborn of many brethren. And that means what he looks like, you're going to look like. And what he does, you do. We are heirs of Christ. And so what this is saying here is that if you go to Colossians 1.16, that this man 2,000 years ago wasn't just a mere man who died, but a God-man who held the whole universe within him. You said, man, that's intense. Well, in Colossians, and this is actually, a, there was actually a song, I believe, I believe uh, if you look at it historically, Colossians 1, 15 through 20 was a song the early church uh, would sing. They believe those are, uh, Philippians 2 is another one. But listen to this about Jesus, okay? It's talking about Jesus. All things have been created through him and for him, right? We actually sang that. That's beautiful. All things have been created through him and for him. Okay, great. And then the very next verse says this. He is before all things, and in him, in Christ, all things hold together. Who is this man who died on that cross? In him. All things hold together. The question is, what is not in him? The question isn't what's, who's in Christ. The question is, 
is there anything not in Christ, according to Colossians 1.17? Interesting, right? All things are in him and hold together by him. That's why when he died, we all died. And when he rose, we all rose. And when he ascended, we've all ascended. And religion wants to keep you down here just believing you're just a saved sinner that's just going to try your best and mope around and maybe make it to heaven. And they're never going to tell you who you are in Christ. And the message of reconciliation comes to tell the world what and who it is in Christ. And so reconciliation in verse 18 All this is from God. We didn't come up with this. (laughs) I couldn't come up with a story like this. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. To reconcile literally means an exchange of equivalent values, right? We talked about the treasure hidden in the field where where Jesus sold all, and he he sold all from heaven. It says he he came down in the form of a servant. He suspended so much of his divine privileges to become a man, to serve us, to die as us, right? And so what that happened, that great exchange, was the act of reconciliation. Jesus was the man who sold everything and purchased us with joy. And that treasure, the message of reconciliation, you say, how do we get people to start believing that they're this treasure in the field, that they're the ones he bought? And it's this message. It's the message of reconciliation. The church is confused, and as we, and if we if we allow the leaven of legalism and moralism, just a little bit, Jesus says, can mess it up, right? A little leaven can spoil the whole bunch. And so we aren't, no one in here would say, well, yeah, I believe you must, you must completely do the 613 commands to be saved in the Old Testament. No one would believe that. You would say, man, you're a legalist. But we would, in many cases, Say, well, you got to have this level of faith. Or you got to have this level of obedience. Or you got to go to church, at least this. Or you got to have this, right? And we'll start a whole new law. Create one. And that leaven gets in there. And the message of reconciliation is negated. Because what does it do? Look at this. This is amazing to us, to me. Well, to us, it should be. (laughs) Verse 19, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Look at this, guys. What does that mean? What do you mean he was reconciling the world to himself? What happened? Not counting their trespasses against them. Entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. If we're going to be ambassadors of reconciliation, one thing we'll have to do is not Count the world's trespasses against it. Because the Savior and the God and the one that we are in, Christ, hung from that cross and looked to the crowd that was cursing him and murdering him and said, Father, forgive them, right? And that's why it says God, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. The Father was reaching through Christ to the world and drawing him. That's why Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all peoples to myself. He was talking about the cross. I want you to hear this word draw. It's the same word that if you were to cast a net, I don't know if anybody does that. I saw a few people doing that yesterday on the bay. Cast a net and you were to get a a few fish. What are some of the fish they get? John or somebody help me out with that. (laughs) What are they trying to get when they cast a net? Yeah. What'd you say? All right, mullet, yeah, mullet, that sounds right. <laughs> it's a cast a net, and you drag them to yourself. That's the word that Jesus is using. Why don't you hear that? If I am lifted up, I will drag all people to myself. Drag. That's the message of recon- reconciliation. He's drawing all people to himself by the beauty of this message that did not count their trespasses against them and it did not count consider anyone according to the flesh. 
The message is not God was so angry at the world that he had to crush his son. It's not John 3, 16. It's God so loved the world that he gave his son. That's reconciliation. The father and son was working together. There was no separation between the two. All this is from God, and the father was in Christ during this, reconciling the world. The Trinity did not implode on itself. It was working together this whole plan, this whole covenant. Some people say when, when and this is kind of how I was taught, but I'm, I'm having different thoughts now because Jesus hung from that cross, and one of the things he said was, my God, my God, remember this? Why have you forsaken me? And, and, and people have taken that to mean that, see, the Father turned his face. He couldn't even look on sin, so he was shamed at the, the way his son had become sin. And, but the problem with that is this. In Psalm 22, 1, which is where that's, the verse starts, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's David who feels forsaken by God. Now, let me ask you this. Was David forsaken by God just because he felt it? Okay, so that takes care of that. But if we want to go a little further, Jesus was entering into the delusion that we feel when we feel separation at the cross. He felt it totally as a man, that whole emotional response to what he was feeling. But God didn't turn his back on it because if you were to read the rest of the psalm, which back in that day, especially the Jews, they had Psalm 22 as a messianic psalm. They had that memorized frontwards and backwards. It's kind of like having a top 10, uh, you know, song on the radio or one of the classics, 80s classics. If I were to, uh, in our culture, if I were to say, you know, just a small town girl, a lot of y'all would be able to complete the next sentence, right? Living in a lonely world. Okay, <laughs> you ain't gonna be ashamed of that. Nothing wrong, it's a great song. Just like the p most popular song, this is the most popular psalm. So when people heard that and they heard Jesus quote that, what he was telling them is this is happening before your eyes. I'm going, I'm fulfilling this prophecy. And look what it says later on in the psalm. He's saying, it says in verse 24 in Psalm 22, for he, the God, God the Father, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. Listen, he, the Father, has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. All these years, I was taught that the Father hid his face from Jesus at the cross. And the, old, the very psalm that Jesus was quoting tells me that the Father did not do that. Why? It's in 2 Corinthians 5. God the Father was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He wasn't hiding his face. He was sticking his face in the son's suffering. And what Jesus felt, he felt. And the pain Jesus felt, he felt. And the forsakenness and the isolation, everything, the darkness, everything that Jesus felt, he felt. God didn't need to reconcile himself to us, but he did need to reconcile the world to himself. And that's what the cross is about. That's what the cross is about. This is the ministry of reconciliation. Look at this, guys, in that same psalm, Psalm 22. Psalm 22, verse 27 says this, all the ends of the world will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. That's verse 27. That psalm, at the end of it, is a victorious psalm because this message of reconciliation will reach the whole world. And the one who's lifted up will drag and draw, <laughs> like he said, all people to himself. He enters into our delusion. He enters into our forsakenness. And the Father fills it too. And the last thing, guys, verse 20, what does that mean for us? Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on the behalf of Jesus to be reconciled to God. It's not no plan B. You're the plan A. 
an ambassador for Christ. An ambassador means a trusted, loyal representative. That's what an ambassador means. You act as him on earth. And it's going to happen through you. You see that? Through us. We want it to happen through the professionals. We want it to happen through Washington. Washington fixed the world. Tallahassee fixed the world. And he says, no, Christ in you is the hope of glory of the world, the kingdom coming. It's not in Washington. It's not in Tallahassee. It's in you. Because I would like to just go ahead and put it off, right? Go ahead and take my responsibility and put it on someone else so I can scream and yell at them about it, right? That'd be a lot easier if I could just scream and yell at the other side, us versus them, right? If I could just get mad at them enough, then the world would change. Guys, I think we've already tried that. (laughs) Maybe we need to try the message of reconciliation. Maybe, just maybe. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. He's not bringing another group. He's bringing you. The church is plan A. Just as God finished the reconciling work through Christ, he's going to finish the announcement of it through us. It's done in the heavenly places. And now he finishes it through us in the announcement. And as the announcement goes forth through us, if it is really the ministry of reconciliation, that's when the healing happens in the cosmos. That's what creation is on its tiptoes waiting for for the sons to become ambassadors. For sons, know your identity first, to become ambassadors. Know your ministry next. It's called reconciliation. For the sons to become ambassadors. And so we don't have to guess what the great announcement is. I guess as we close here, guys, verse 21 is a great memory verse because Paul makes it crystal clear in, in some ways, I think this is the most action-packed gospel verse in the way he, he's, he succinctly just says it. And so, so he's not making us guess what this, this ministry or what this message consists of. He says, this is, the, this is the thing. If you want the Jesus to drag all people to himself, you must be an ambassador of the message of reconciliation. And it better be centered on stuff like verse 21. For our sake... He made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. At the end of all this thing, the world is dead, but what do they need to know in verse 21? That in Christ, they have become what? The righteousness of God. The righteousness of God, just as you should be. This is the great announcement. This is the great exchange of reconciliation that we see. He becomes sin. He enters into our delusion. That word sin, hamartia, means to share not or to not take part in or to forfeit. So many privileges were forfeited by Adam and Eve in the garden. And one of those mentally was they were shamed. They were condemned in their minds. The Father still shows up. And so now Jesus goes in and he enters into that. He enters into what they felt. He enters into the condemnation. He enters into the shame. He enters in. He forfeits literally what he gives so he can enter into what we forfeited. He didn't become a sinner, but he became sin, right? And treated as sin at the cross so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We are as we should be in Christ. That's righteousness. We are in right relationship, in total union with the Father. That's righteousness. You can add nothing to it. And if you think you can add anything to your righteousness, that's religion. You can enjoy it. You can rest in it. And you can go forth in peace with it. And you can go forth with the message of reconciliation that what you are in Christ, they are in Christ. Amen. Last verse, I'm not going to give any commentary on this, but I think it's perfect. Colossians 1, 19 through 20. 
For in Christ, okay, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And this is the kicker, verse 20. And through him, through Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. What's he going to reconcile to himself? All things, whether in earth or in heaven. How can he do such a thing? Blood of the cross. We've undersold the blood a little bit, haven't we? <laughs> I think so. Father of glory, thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you are in Christ, exchanging, pleading, restoring, healing, forgiving, and bringing the world to yourself. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Let us become and know we are truly your ambassadors, your sons first, who are your ambassadors. And let the message of reconciliation affect us first. Let it open us first. And as it does that, let it just leak out to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, I want